Mark, it's all yours. Awesome. Well, it's good to see uh, so many familiar faces. I miss um, I miss attending this group, uh, which I did for years when we had lunch there in, in person in downtown Portland. Um, I have to tell you guys that uh, your work and these meetings informed me and my work a long time ago. And um, so please don't stop. Please keep spreading the word about the work you do, because I think you you all bring a technical aspect to this that is pretty thin on the ground out there. And we need a lot more people looking at um, the science and the and the actual technology, the engineering level uh, thought process around you know the solutions going forward. So um, that said, um, yes, I was uh, very recently appointed to the Climate Energy and Environment Committee. Um, I was previously serving on three other committees, uh, one of which had some climate uh, nexus, but wasn't as direct as this one. So it, it's going to be a pleasure to be able to engage in that um, going forward. I want to start at sort of the 30,000 foot level and let you know um, the state legislative system is pretty dysfunctional, period, uh, relative to, to at least Milwaukee city government uh, processes. Uh, the state process is not good. Uh, the number of bills that legislators, like a given committee, um, is going to be required to consider and the length of time in which we have to consider that means that they are not well considered. Uh, the, the, you know, the processes that happen in discussions before session or uh, in one-on-one -on -one conversations um, really steers how that bill will move forward more than the process that we all watch, you know, when we watch hearings and and assume that that committee is is deeply considering those concepts. Uh, there are things we can do to fix that. Um, um, we, if we had bill limits each session, that would help. If we had uh, um, eight month sessions every year instead of a six month session every other year. Um, those are things that we could do that would actually change that dynamic. Having all of our meeting rooms will help. Uh, that's been part of the problem. We've been shy to meeting rooms because of the construction. And that will change in 25, but the bigger, bigger problem still will exist. Of course, we also have the dysfunctionality of the fact that the Republicans have veto power. Uh, they walk out of the building and we are we come to a screeching halt because of our very odd quorum rules. Um, I think there are only other three other states in the union that have the same quorum rules that we have. Uh, Congress, every city council in the world, um, and the other 46 states um, all have a, a quorum that is just the uh, a simple majority. Right? Oh, Mark, fifty percent plus one. Mark, excuse me for interrupting, but one of my questions. Uh, my question is: Do you want people to ask questions as they come up, or should should we wait until you're done? Um, I'm fine with. Uh, I, I don't have a prepared presentation here, so I'm fine answering questions as we go. And if I say things that. Um, are unclear. I would pr prefer to clean that up as we go, so that everyone's on the same page. Regarding quorum rules, and what, how many Republicans and how many Democrats are in the House? And um, so you've got the House and the Senate. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, you guys. Uh, I think it's we have 34 Democrats. I think. Um, out of 60 and then uh, 34 or 35 and then uh, in the house we also have a majority of I think three right now um, and it it's a the quorum is is two-thirds yeah uh, so it, until we have that super majority that's that's one version of the Oregon supermajority uh, then 
then Republicans can control what 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 gets passed because they can just walk out of the building and, and stop the voting. Uh, there will be a bill proposed in this short session that would refer that to the voters. Um, if the Republicans don't walk out and stop it, um, then we can actually maybe get that fixed uh, next November. So that is the sort of starting point that we're at. You know, every time we've come with a big, hard climate bill, the Republicans have walked out. Uh, so it is very difficult, generally speaking, to do the kinds of things necessary. The 25 session will be all about transportation. Clearly, there's a giant nexus between transportation and climate. It's, it's still our number one um, uh, greenhouse gas emitting uh, sector in this state. Um, there is an opportunity to fix uh, our the way we fund transportation and therefore the way you tilt that playing field so that it becomes more financially advantageous to use uh, either more fuel efficient cars or EVs or whatever. That's a possibility that exists in 25. It's going to be a giant fight, period. Uh, they should have raised the gas tax 50 cents back in 2017, the last time they went through this process. They did not have the nerve to do that. They raised it a nickel, um, and it is not even remotely enough. Uh, ODOT reported in our Ways and Means subcommittee uh, that they have bridges that they will not touch for the next 200 years based on the current um, trajectory of funding and and you know breakdown of the of the infrastructure and as engineers i'm sure you're all aware that there aren't bridges out there that are designed to last for 200 years so um problematic uh that's that's going to be the big the big thing in 25 i will be bringing also and i don't know exactly what it looks like yet uh, a very important bill around transmission electrical transmission um it is something that is not talked about nearly enough um, the state has set some pretty decent greenhouse gas or or uh, yeah it's that that our energy sources will be 80 percent you know renewables by the state and 90 percent by the state and 100 percent by this state we will not hit any of those goals and none of those goals are aligned with the IPCC uh, uh, standards that have been set. They, they are behind that. And, and yet we will not hit any of our goals because uh, we do not have the transmission capacity to add new sources of electricity. Right now, there are over 60 solar and or wind projects waiting for permits in this state right now they cannot get permits because they cannot get capacity on the transmission system. Isn't that a lot of federal problem in as far as like getting, you know, there's a lot, there's lots of federal review for, for uh, permitting. So what can we do on the state level that would help free it up? I mean, and even if we did, would that make any difference? Excellent question. And that is, I have a uh, work group seated that has Bonneville, it has the three utilities, it has ODOE, it has uh, um, energy producers, it has environmental groups, it has all the players at the table, except the feds. Um, yes, so to, to illustrate what, um, was it Adam that just said that? I couldn't see who was talking. Yeah, it was, it was me, sorry. Um, to illustrate what Adam's talking about, the one new transmission project that Oregon has attempted to put in the ground in this century. Um, they began the process in 2008. It's a fairly small line from uh, Hemingway, Idaho to Boardman, Oregon. Uh, they began the process in 2008. If all of the ducks stay in a row and we get very, very lucky, we will begin construction in two years. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. So 20 years is more or less what this process is going to have been from the day they started trying to 
create that line to the day that it will actually be functional. That is clearly way, way, way too long given the timelines that we're looking at on climate. So uh, to answer your question, yes, the state government has relatively limited capacity to control that process. Part of it is a federal problem. The, the, when you're running uh, a right-of-way, a new right-of-way through federal property, the process is pretty extensive. However, ODOE's process is also extensive and is problematic, as near as I can tell. We're waiting for ODOE to rebut uh, Idaho Power's presentation that they gave at the last work group. But um, when when a line had to change in one place on the on the alignment because a property owner just refused to, to sell it right away, um, that caused the ODOE process to start from scratch. That's insanity. That 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 is not the way that this can work. So there there are some. We're looking for where the sweet spots are. Here is the bigger problem, however. The West, which is to say anything west of the eastern Colorado border to the Pacific, from Canada to Mexico, is the biggest part of the United States that is not in a regional transmission organization. The rest of the United States is in a variety of regional transmission organizations, which is to say an organization that is uh, governed by a process that was established by those utilities and those states that are involved and that entity not only plans for transmission but actually funds and uh, and begins the processes even if it's eventually built by a private entity they they shepherd that process through um, we do not have that in the West, other than California. California has the California Independent Systems Operators, KISTO, which is one of the most highly rated uh, RTOs in the country. Um, in my perfect world, uh, all of the West would just join KISO. We would become part of KISO. Um, there are some governmental issues around that on both sides, um, and it seems to not be where Bonneville seems to be heading. There is another RTO called Southwest Power Pool. It's not actually an RTO, but it's similar. Um, and I think they're headquartered out of Arkansas or someplace. They um, are working with Bonneville. Um, they are being considered very carefully by Bonneville to be the um, the organizing entity for at least that Bonneville will join, which is problematic because they are 75% of the transmission in the state of Oregon. Um, I have been in conversation with legislators from Colorado, and Nevada, um, people involved with KISO, and I'm meeting with more legislators tomorrow or Thursday, I forget, uh, up in Washington. Um, to have a conversation about forming a, a, a regional transmission organization. That is, that is the right next step. That's the way that this uh, proceeds in, an, in a sane manner. The problem, as Adam pointed out, is um, Bonneville doesn't answer to us. Bonneville almost doesn't answer to Congress. Bonneville is a little bit like the railroads. It was set up during World War II to provide energy to make uh, to to um, make aluminum for airplanes, bluntly, um, and has since then provided the cheapest electricity in North America to uh, Washington and Oregon, um, which we all love and are very spoiled by, and is part of why we develop renewables less quickly than some other parts of the country. Uh, because they don't pencil. Um, we, my thought is that if Oregon passed a bill that said that Oregon will be part of an RTO by 2030, which is something that Colorado and Nevada both did, 
uh, then we can go to our federal delegation, particularly if Washington does it as well. We can all go to our federal delegation and say, look, you need to get Bonneville aligned with the states and you need to cause Bonneville to prioritize the same state policies. I mean, we, we the, you know, Oregon, Washington, California, Colorado, and even Nevada to some degree have pretty solid climate policies that are similar. They're not maybe exactly aligned, but they're very similar. Um, and Bonneville doesn't care. They, they have no reason to, to care about that. Uh, so that's, that's the big thing I'm working on right now, because frankly, no one else, it's not that I wanted to do this. Um, I was seeing this big gaping hole in the fact that we weren't going to hit any of our climate metrics and no one was doing anything about the bottleneck. So, um, any questions about that? That's an ongoing process. I'd love for you guys to stay engaged because I need as many smart people in working on thinking about this as possible. Um, all right. Is so, the, a question: Is there a bill number or an LC on this yet? No, because it, it'll be for twenty-five. Um, I was thinking about dropping it for twenty-four, mm -hmm. and um, was strongly advised against it by many in the leadership. Uh, Rep. Marsh would only was only willing to promise me that she would allow it to be heard, but it might not be heard until after the deadline. Um, and so uh, everyone is just strongly encouraged me to hold that until 25. So, okay, but perhaps something we should say as we meet with legislators: this is a big hole. We need to deal with it in the long session. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We need to get the rest of the legislature to have an awareness. And they should, I mean, we had a hearing in uh, climate, energy, and environment on whatever it was last week, mm -hmm. Monday, right? Um, that if you listened very carefully, you learned most of what I just talked about. But you had to listen very carefully because it was very much in, in bureaucracy speak, and they have a way of saying things as unclearly as possible. Um, <laughs> and very often people need it spelled out as clearly as possible. <laughs> yes, they do, <laughs> particularly for legislators. Um, so, uh, so that is an ongoing process. Pam and I will be working on that. Um, I think Kathleen Taylor is interested. Uh, uh, Golden will be there. I mean, we'll we'll have a confam. We'll have a solid group of people that's that understand that what a bottleneck this is. Um, and, and it's gonna require work with our federal delegation. That, and when I spoke to Merkley about that a couple of weeks ago, he just started shaking his head as soon as I said the word transmission. And he said, that is a big complicated mess and I don't even understand it. And I don't know how I can help. I was like, that's not good, dude, because you are literally the place where we need help. So we'll, we'll work with, We'll work with the federal delegation and try and get them up to speed and get them get a fire lit under them. Unfortunately, Bonneville cares more about what the legislators, the Congress people out of Washington think than they care about what the people out of Oregon think because we are 25% of their business and Washington is 75% of their business. <laughs> Ish. I think there's some uh, British Columbia, a little bit out to Idaho little dribs and drabs everywhere else, but ish. Um, so that's why I'm meeting with the legislators from Washington. Let's see if we can't create a coalition to, to dig in on this pretty quickly. So another thing I wanted to talk to you all about, you may have observed this over the years. I certainly did as a mayor that environmental bills climate bills in particular would come to the legislature in kind of a hit and miss way and bills some bill would become a big deal that really wasn't going to do that much and another bill that really would have mattered didn't get a lot of juice and it, it just it has not felt organized or um 
prioritized in a scientific manner. Um, and that is still today, today, as of this next short session, that will be the truth. Um, the, the various environmental groups that pressure uh, the legislature to do this and to do that come up with the things they care about individually and come to the legislature. They're starting to organize, but I'm not super thrilled with their organization system because it's a little bit of a pay to play thing. The people that are donating the most get the most juice in the prioritization process. That's not good. Um, so CONFAM, Maxine Dexter and I last summer, not this last summer, a year ago, summer, um, came up with a concept that we should professionalize the environmental caucus in the Oregon legislature, which is to say to have a full-time staffer. Ideally, in our perfect world, eventually it will be three staffers. But right now we have one. Um, and the purpose of that is to start to herd those cats, to start to pull together all of the environmental bills that the legislature is thinking about, all the environmental bills that the advocates are thinking about, and then having a process by which we determine which, which ones are low-hanging fruit, that's a good thing to know, which ones are going to do the most good, have the most climate or water or whatever the issue is, impact. And then that's how we prioritize the bills that we push through the session rather than whatever, you know, juice a particular lobbyist has walking in the door. Um, so that process is underway. We funded, we, we hired our staffer uh, finally in April, I think. Uh, her name's Catherine Duvall. She's very smart. Um, it has taken her a while to herd the cats that are the legislature uh, to the point where we have kind of rules and uh, all these things. So it, it's the process of creating a professionalized caucus is still underway to a certain degree. Um, we funded her initially during session out of our own office budgets. Each one of us donated random amounts. I donated $5,000 out of mine, which is becoming problematic for me now, but um, I needed to make sure that, that that was funded. Several others donated. We were able to pay her wages through session and for the first three months after session. Now she is working part-time for the state um, and very part-time, like 5% of her time or something is for the state. And the rest of her time is being funded through a PAC. Through, it's, it's a political PAC, just like any other political PAC that Khan and Maxine and I set up. Um, we have raised so far about 20, I think it's $27,000 or something, which is roughly a sixth of what we need uh, for the biennium. I am working with leadership to try and come up with a way that the state actually fund this position going forward. Um, it will be unusual if that happens. There is only one caucus that has a state funded staffer and that's the BIPOC caucus. Um, but this, to me, this is such an important issue that, that in a sane world, we would do this. Um, and the, the current speaker agrees with that. I don't know what the new speaker will think, uh, but we're, we're working on that. So that's ongoing. That's a place that individuals can feel free to help, um, is to help fund that pack. Uh, and when you are in meters, meetings with leadership, um, bring up the fact that you believe that the, the that caucus should be funded uh, through the state budget. Um, so that's that piece. By 25, I expect uh, us to the, the, the caucus to walk in uh, with a pretty solid list of vetted bills um, that we will be prioritizing and hopefully we will have we will have done that in um, conjunction coordination with the various um, environmental groups 
so that we are all in more or less lockstep moving into that session. Um, I honestly think that that is one of the two keys to Oregon resuming its place as an environmental leader. I have to tell you, I was at NCEL this last summer, which is the National Coalition of Environmental Legislators, and there are a whole bunch of states that are passing us up. Uh, New Jersey, for example, is passing us up pretty badly. Um, so uh, we have kind of rested on our laurels as an environmental leader, and um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, Mark, Mark, could I, yeah. could I ask you, uh, you commented about the uh, Republicans uh, not wanting to play ball here. And I keep thinking about that when you talk about 2025 and so on. Is there, you have ideas of, will they be, go for some of this or, or what, what do you, what does that look like? Yeah, I, I have not started to have the transmission conversations with the bulk of the environmentalists. I do have one, or bulk of the Republicans. I do have one Republican on my transmission uh, work group. Uh, it's Boomer, right, out of, um, off the coast. He's, Coos Bay is his, uh, part of his district. He's very interested in this because the wind farm will be good for Coos Bay despite some opposition currently. Um, and it will actually, frankly, be good for the coast. Uh, but in order for that to actually happen, we are going to have to have a new transmission line that we can get the bulk of that energy back to the valley. Um, whether that's a subsea line that goes up the coast and then up the Columbia, that's one way. And it might actually be faster given the 25 or 20 years it's taken to to Boardman to Hemingway. Um, in any case, we will need new transmission and Boomer is smart enough to understand that. And I think that's the saving grace is that even if the Republicans refuse to admit that climate change is real, uh, they are not so stupid as to not recognize that we are transmission transitioning our electric, our our vehicular system into electric cars that is happening uh and we can't we can't we don't have the electricity to do that we we literally that won't happen uh we're also going to have issues with all of the the tech companies that are building their server farms uh in the state because we have such a cheap electricity um Again, they, they are very concerned. Uh, Amazon Web Services actually sends a representative to my uh, work group because they are very interested in seeing new transmission lines so that they can meet their net zero goals as well. Did, that, did, I, answer, I, did I wander completely off the topic of that question or did I answer it? <laughs> Sorry. I, my, my, I may have been off the topic there, but I is, uh, appreciate your comments about the generation around Coos Bay and getting getting the power into the you know into the grid. Uh, yeah. Um. So so that was all by way of saying it is possible that a bill ba that is working to make transmission able to be cited faster. Um and in a much more coordinated way, it's possible that that could be a bipartisan thing. Hmm. It's so hard to tell with those guys, but um, I will, once we start to distill more what the bill is going to be, because it's going to be more than what I was thinking about for the short session, which was simply the bill that said, we will be part of an RTO by X date. Um, I think in 25, we'll have a lot more to put in it that may direct ODOE to do certain things, that may direct the PUC to do certain things, uh, and it may request um, our federal delegation uh, do certain things. Um, we'll see where we land. So uh, the transmission one might, might not be a walkout kind of a bill. 
Um, I was trying to think what else you wanted me to talk about. So the, during the short session, there are a handful of smaller, but really no seriously climate related bills that I can think of. Catherine was going to send me the spreadsheet and she may well have done it. I have been very busy all morning. Let me look super quick, you guys, and I can see. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. No, she didn't. Looks like she didn't get a chance to do it. It was just yesterday afternoon I asked her to do it, so it was pretty short notice. Could you could you email us a summary of uh, those those bills, and we could pass that out to our members? And yeah, I think you know a lot of them are going to be around things that are not directly climate related. Uh, we have PFAS issues, uh, the the forever chemicals. Uh, some of those are being we're running leachate from landfills through um, municipal sewage treatment plants, which were never designed for that kind of treatment. Uh, so the PFAS that's in that is either ending up um, in the solids that are land applied on farms or directly into the rivers. So uh, there's a bill that will um, start to address that. We'll, we'll do some testing around that. Um, geez, there are bills around how we pay for forest fires. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of bills. They're all relatively small because short session. Uh, and I am not remembering a climate bill that got me excited. So, but I can, uh, I'll get Catherine or, or I will directly email you a link to our spreadsheet. What, one you question. Don't get it in the next week. <laughs> Bug me. You'll hear it from me. All right. OK. Uh, well, one thing that I wanted to have you talk a little bit is what can we as individuals do to address uh, our concerns around climate change with the legislature? Uh, suggestions yes um and and so i've got the the big sort of general suggestion which is that uh with with the exception of a, a relatively small handful of us climate is appears never to be the priority of the legislature it's gross but you know this year it's housing and homelessness and i get it that's important but we should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We should be able to address that hard thing and climate simultaneously. And the leadership in the state is not there. Tina was never a climate champion. She was a climate okay person. Um, so every single time you talk to a legislator, you have to help them visualize how bad it's going to be if we don't do something and do it quickly. So that's that's the first step. As, as we start to crystallize the bills for 25, having technical people like you all be able to walk into those rooms and help those folks understand those bills, because a lot of them, it won't be in their committee so they won't even see that bill until it's going to come to the floor. And if it's going to be a partisan vote, then the first time they'll hear about it is in caucus. And, and whoever the bill uh, carrier is will explain the bill, will explain the pros and the cons, assuming there are cons, or what the people who are opposed to it are saying are the cons. And then there will we will determine whether or not there are the votes in the Democratic side to pass it. That is not a slam dunk on climate stuff, unfortunately. And this is why I said the first part of what I said when you said, what can we do? Um, there are a lot of legislators who are Democrats who 
climate is is something they a don't care about and b they buy into the concept that if we are actually addressing climate in an aggressive way it's going to hurt business so we have we have our work cut out for us but this is why we wanted to professionalize the caucus so that so that all the advocates are focused on the same thing so that we're not sending mixed messages out there and confusing legislators who aren't in those committees you have to understand like housing and homelessness this year we had i think 190 bills that were assigned to our to our uh committee we heard maybe 70 of those in 90 minutes twice a week for those three months that they're on our side of the building. So you can do that math. It means there wasn't a lot of time for each bill. Um, and that's, that's the case by and large for most of the bigger committees that there are just way too many bills. And so you cannot even consider digging into bills that are not in your committee. You just do, don't have the time. I read none of the education bills. I read none of the health care bills, even though I'm a huge proponent for universal health care. Did not read that bill. There's just physically not the time in the day. So it is up to the advocates like you all, and you all are particularly powerful because you can bring the technical gravitas to it that a lot of the advocates don't bring when they come to talk to us so you know generally speaking that's that's what i would say and then um you know individually not as an organization but individually make sure that there's going to be some pretty significant changeover in the legislature this year right you've got what now, two or three House members that are running for Congress. You've got um, people that are running for Senate on, you know, the Oregon Senate. So there's going to be a lot of empty seats to be filled. We need to make sure that every empty seat that is filled is a climate champion. I, you know, there are some awfully nice people, good hearted, well meaning believe in climate change lovely we need actual climate champions we need people that understand it and that is their number one priority because even for somebody like me who that is my number one priority i am so inundated in all the things that i have to work on i get to work on climate like 20 percent of my time maybe maybe and i should be doing it 100 percent of my time i wasn't even on that committee so now i'm on that committee that's helpful um so that's those are the two big things help help fund the caucus help fund environmental legislators um those are those are the ways i had a question sir yes uh put in the chat here is there any effort to combat the issue of microplastics there was a show recently on oregon field guide that really went into this did a good job on it and the I was surprised that even the most pristine waters in the Rogue River and the Deschutes uh, were found to contain microplastics. So I'm just curious if that's on your radar. It is on my radar. I actually had a bill in the last session that would have required, um, and I know this is a small step, but at least it was a step that would require washing machines to have a filter that could filter out uh, microplastics. And there, there would be add-on filters that you could put on your existing washing machine and then all new washing machines that came into the state after some certain date i forget what it was would have to have that built in didn't even get a hearing yeah. um, it's according it, to the show that would actually be a huge step forward i think they said seven hundred thousand fibers per load per wash load enter the system and like you said earlier the the wastewater treatment plants are simply not designed to filter stuff that small yeah um so this is here's a here's a fun technical question for you all that are um tech geeks at what point does it make sense for us to use reverse osmosis 
on every single sewage treatment plant output. Because that would filter out PFAS, it would filter out the microplastics, it would filter out the estrogen and all the other uh, drugs that we um, either flush down the toilet or pee out of our bodies that currently are not being treated because the system does not treat for that either. So all of that stuff is going into the ocean and having a knock-on effect there, um, you know, also in the rivers, of course. So that would be an interesting thing for to, to sort of have somebody, a, a technical group to really dig into. Uh, I know it's fairly energy intensive and expensive to do um, reverse osmosis. I'm pretty sure that LA is doing it now with their wastewater treatment system because they are recycling all of their wastewater. Um, and they're aware of all you know all the same things that i just talked about uh, they're also beginning to do desalinization which is a very similar process actually uh, energy wise as i understand it again not my area of expertise by any stretch so it would be a, it would be an interesting thing to look into that might be the the best possible solution because even if we pass a law that says everyone's got to put these filters on their washing machines, what are the odds we get everyone to put these filters on their washing machines? Right? We might get a 20% compliance or something like that. So we're, you know, 15 years out before all the washing machines are replaced with new ones that have the filters built in. And then the first time some clown has to replace his filter, he just takes it off and throws it away and there that's he's done. So, you know, I don't know that that's the the best solution to that problem. It's, a, it's another one of those unaccounted for negative externalities, right? And we've, we're we're awash in them. So in, in, until we <laughs> until we have like some way to to price that externality, how can you say what it when it would would it be worth it to 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 deal with it? And there are so many people and groups out there that they're actively working to prevent those externalities from being priced. You know, because they just want to delay, 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 delay. Um, sure, so, because I mean, it's it, it's going to affect their bottom line, and, right. and and they have very large bottom lines to work with, in order to advocate for said delays. Yeah. Yeah, and and the thing is, is like, sure, the delay is going to work great until it doesn't, and then it's going to just blow up everything. Right. Yeah. But but when is that going to happen? And how do you convince someone that is going to be dead when that actually is going to come around that they need to start acting now? You know, well, I you know, I don't think it's actually as far in the future as a lot of people are imagining. I don't know how many of you remember the National Geographic uh, article that came out. I want to say six years ago now, but they gathered all of the scientists that they work with who work in the realm of the ocean, oceanographers, marine biologists, you know, a whole raft of people, because everyone works in their own silo, right? And they don't sort of cross contaminate or, you know, cross tabulate their, their different learning. So that's the process that the geographic pulled together. And the end result was that given all the things from uh, you know, oil leaks from the offshore wells, uh, the pesticides and herbicides coming down the rivers, um, uh, the, the dead zones caused, you know, all, all the things that we're doing to the oceans, plastics, they named the plastics. They said that effectively the oceans would be dead by 2045. Mm. That's shocking. It's horrifying. And, and there are people alive today that will be alive when that happens. Uh, so it's not that far in the future. Yeah, it's, it's one of those systems that are, the earth is nonlinear, right? And how do you convince someone <laughs> of, you know, the nonlinearity of this, of a system is gonna, you know, change the way, the way your future, you know, 
our yeah. experience, uh, we, our, we don't have, we don't have a, a way to be intuitive about non-linearity. We don't. We didn't evolve having to worry about that, and right. we also didn't evolve with a realization that it's a very limited closed system, either. I mean, I can remember as a child, my father, who was a civil engineer, telling me that uh, the solution to d pollution was dilution. Dilution. I've heard it. Yep. <laughs> And that was literally how things were being designed back then. That was that was the answer. That was the answer to chemical plants. It was the answer to wastewater treatment. All of those things. And that we we are paying the price. I mean, uh, so we're trying to remove Kellogg Dam in Milwaukee. There is four feet of mud that is completely contaminated with DDT and and other um, chemicals that were used on the farms in the surrounding area for decades. Mm. Those are the kinds of, and you know, the, that same strata of mud exists in the Willamette River. So yeah, it's um, there. It's a lot, and so I am open to really good ideas around that. Um, and I and I actually am seeking honest solutions. The best we could come up with at the time was the filters on the washing machines, but again, I've you know sort of laid out the the problems with that. So if there's a, a a better single point solution to that, that's probably where we ought to go. One that the government is in control of instead of individual homeowners. You, you, um, have, a, you, you have a question in the chat. I'm seeing that. Why can I talk? Can I talk more about why I think BPA should be part of a different market? Uh, I don't think they should be part of a different market. That's my concern with them aligning with the Southwest Power Pool. Um, I would much prefer they were aligned with, with Kaiso in a West wide, uh, so bro I'm not sure what you're asking in this question, Jack. Um, but broadly speaking, the more, the, the larger, the geographic area that we are pulling electrons from and sending electrons to the faster we can get to 100% renewables, right? Because the wind is always blowing and the sun is always shining. Well, assuming you did this as a global system, it's always shining somewhere. Um, it's certainly shining more in Southern California right now than it is in Oregon, right? So if we are part of that system, we can take advantage of those simple geographic facts. Also, having a regional transmission system in the coming years when there will be bigger and more catastrophic wildfires will allow us to route energy around those fires. Right now, there is basically one north-south trunk between Oregon and California. And when there's a big fire that threatens that, it becomes problematic really fast. Uh, and not just that the fire itself could destroy the transmission system, uh, the heavy smoke causes that whole system to have problems. And just the sheer heat, if you're close enough to that fire. So what the limiting factor is on the transmission lines is heat. Um, and the, the hotter they get, the, the less, A, the less they function. And at some point they, they, they fail, right? Um, that's actually one of the technologies on the good side that we could utilize to boost our transmission with, within our existing system is they could add sensors to the lines that, that in real time uh, let them know how hot the lines are, and then they could add more energy to a line that is rated X, but it's rated X for sort of the hottest day kind of thing, rather than all the time. So we the, the calculation is that just by doing that throughout the system, we could boost the amount of transmission uh, by about 25%. Fires add a whole new wrinkle to that. And if we don't have a bigger, more robust system where we can wheel energy around the fires, it is going to get problematic as well. So did I answer the question you were asking? If I didn't, Please rephrase it. <laughs> well, when you when you say regional, you mean you mean you mean when I hear the word regional, I think 
a region is like the Pacific Northwest, but when you use the term, you mean a much broader region than that, like the like the West Coast or or the United States or something. Well, the the best the best possible transmission system would be global, literally global. The second best would be the entire North you know, entirety of North America. And the third best for us would be a West wide. So from the Eastern border of Colorado to the Pacific Ocean from Canada, actually goes up into Canada and then down to the Mexican border. Um, that would be the, in my perfect world right now today, the best regional transmission organization we could have is one that was facilitating transmission in that broad geographic area. And right now, Bonneville has tentacles into Idaho, British Columbia, Montana, I think a little bit, uh, but mostly it's Washington and Oregon. And they are 75% of our transmission system in this state. So it's just, and, and the other really brilliant thing, particularly if we set it up right, Bonneville gets the cheapest possible money. When they get loans to do projects, they get money at the same rate that the banks get money. So we could be building out the transmission system for the entire West at a far lower rate than if some private uh, transmission developer came in and took out a loan to, to build a big system which they exist, there are, there are private entities that do this. But the main thing we need is a unified planning system to where we are thinking about transmission west-wide. Did that? Oh yeah, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? I know we got a little bit late start because of the uh, Zoom link, but uh, if anyone else has a question, generally we quit around one, and uh, I suspect uh, Mark may have another meeting to go to. So. <laughs> I have to get up to Seattle for um, the, the National Coalition of Environmental uh, Legislators is pulling together um, a conference that is just for legislators from uh Oregon, Washington, California to talk about A, ocean health and B, offshore wind. Mm -hmm. And that's in Seattle starting uh, tomorrow morning, first thing, bright and early. Well, unless anybody has a really burning question, uh, Mark, we really thank you for your time. Uh, I've, I know I've learned a lot and uh, look forward to talking with you in the near future. Absolutely, anytime. Like I said, I, I miss coming to your meetings. I really, uh, I honest to God do. Thank you very much, Mark. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, did it Thanks, Mark. Take care. Bye. Thank you for hosting this.